Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, healthcare professionals and any other attendees we may be having, karibuni sana to our COVID-19 case management uh, series of webinars. This is our fifth webinar since we started and we will be discussing COVID-19 testing strategies. Our moderator today will be Dr. Felistas Bosibori, who's the medical director, Kisi Teaching and Referral Hospital. So karibu sana Dr. Felistas Bosibori and to all our attendees, over. Thank you so much, uh, Jemima. Um, so as you've been told, my name is uh, Dr. Felistas uh, Bosibori um, from Kisi Teaching and Referral Hospital. Um, so today we are going to discuss on the COVID-19 uh, testing strategies. We will have a presentation uh, from uh, Dr. Francis Kiigu. Dr. Francis Kiigu is the clinical pathologist at Nairobi Hospital. Uh, we are also going to have our panelists uh, uh, today that are going to help us in the discussion and question and answer session. We have uh, Dr. Kibet Shikuku, who is the laboratory director, uh, microbiology and uh, infectious diseases and research uh, laboratory. We also have uh, Dr. Alice uh, Kanyua, um, who is the head of microbiology and molecular section of the Nairobi Hospital. Uh, we have Dr. Abu Abubakar Abdillahi, sorry, uh, who is the instructor microbiology and molecular section uh, uh, from the Aga Khan uh, University Hospital. Um, so feel free to uh, uh, raise your questions on the chat box and we will be able to analyze them and they'll be answered at the end of the session. So I want to welcome uh, Dr. Francis Kiibu to start us off with um, his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bosibori. Um, as introduced, my name is Dr. Kiibu, a clinical pathologist at the Nairobi Hospital. And it is my privilege uh, to be part of this discussion to look at the uh, COVID-19 uh, testing strategy. So as a way of background, um, SARS-CoV-2, which is the causative agent for COVID-19, belongs to the large family of coronavirus. Um, and we have quite a number of viruses of interest um, that have been associated with the pathogenicity in human beings. Within this broad family, we have um, four genera. Um, starting off, we have the alpha coronavirus, where we have two viruses, human coronavirus 229E and the human coronavirus NL63. And they are of importance because they have been associated with uh, mild respiratory disease, presenting as a common cold. Um, on top of that, we have, um, we have a beta coronavirus um, within the same uh, family, but a different genera now. Um, and within this beta coronavirus, we have uh, polynidates. In the lineage A, we have human coronavirus, uh, OC43, and human cor coronavirus HKU1. Again, these have been associated with um, uh, mild respiratory disease, again, presenting as a common cause. Uh, within the lineage B, which is also referred to as the Sebe coronavirus, we have SARS CoV and we have SARS CoV 2. Um, and these two have been associated with um, severe respiratory uh, syndromes. Within uh, the same lineage, again, we have uh, the bad SARS like coronavirus, and it's of interest or of importance because it has a very high uh, genomic homology uh, compared to the SARS coronavirus. In the other lineage, that's lineage C, we have MASCO. So we have quite a number of uh, viruses within this family that have been associated with um, human uh, pathogenicity. Looking at uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, it's a single-stranded um, 
RNA virus uh, enveloped. And um, as we can appreciate uh, from this diagram, there are quite a number of structures that are of interest for various reasons. One of the reasons being that um, they provide us with a way of identifying the virus. For example, the spike protein, uh, as well as using um, the, 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 the RNA. We can use those two structures to identify the virus. Um, on top of that, uh, some of these structures are targets of uh, the immune response that is mounted by the body. And um, uh, on top of that, they can also serve as targets for antiviral therapy, as well as targets for um, vaccines. So, um, SARS-CoV-2 causes uh, COVID-19, and uh, COVID-19 is, uh, as we know, a systemic disease um, affecting multiple organs. And principally, the point of entry is uh, the respiratory tract. Um, and the, the receptor of interest is the S2, S2 receptor uh, that is in high abundance within uh, the respiratory tree, whether it is the ciliated cells, whether it is the goblet cells, or the alveolar cells. Um, but other than the respiratory tract, we do have these uh, receptors in other organs, including the gastrointestinal tract. We have these uh, receptors um, in the heart. We have these receptors even in the kidneys. And this uh, sort of distribution explains the sort of um, organ dysfunction, multi-organ dysfunction that is witnessed in patients with um, COVID-19 disease. So when it comes to lab testing, um, this is um, what I'll be laying emphasis on. I'll be discussing um, diagnostic testing. I'll be discussing the role of serological testing. I'll also be looking at the pitfalls and some of the challenges associated with testing. And we'll also be looking at uh, the role of uh, auxiliary tests uh, in uh, COVID-19 testing, as well as the strategies um, that can be used um, in COVID-19 testing. So, um, the lab is very critical in terms of uh, clinching diagnosis of uh, COVID-19 uh, because by definition, um, a, a positive case is a person with a lab confirmation of COVID-19 irrespective of clinical symptoms or clinical signs. The recommended um, test for diagnosis is um, polymerase chain reaction, that is PCR, preferably from a collection of, um, from the upper respiratory tract. And the specimen that I recommended is a combination of uh, nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs. We do have, and we have a com come across instances where the clinical suspicion is very high but um, the specimens from the upper respiratory tract have tested negative. And in such scenarios, what is recommended that um, we can go ahead and collect specimen from the lower respiratory tree. Um, and here we are talking about things like sputum and bronchobular lavages, or even endotracheal aspirates, and go ahead and test for SARS-CoV-2 from the same. So as mentioned or as stated, the lab is critical and it's not only critical for diagnosis, the lab is also center in terms of the epidemiological surveillance um, using, uh, for example, antibody or serological testing. <clears throat> it's also important um, for prognostication as well as therapeutic monitoring. And this can be done through use of uh, markers of uh, inflammation, 
for example, uh, C-reactive protein or use of ferritin or even LDH among other markers of inflammation. So um, this diagram is important for understanding uh, or appreciating the behavior of um, serological markers and molecular markers in COVID-19 throughout the course of the disease. And um, looking at, for example, at the viral load, it's uh, important to appreciate that um, the patients who have COVID-19 are usually infectious and have a significant viral load even uh, way before onset of symptoms. Usually about two days before the onset of symptoms, they'll have significant viral loads that can be detected, that can be detected by testing. And these uh, virus load will usually uh, go down and uh, clear by around day 10 for most of the patients who don't have a protracted disease course. And um, you have um, antibodies developing from around uh, between day seven and day 10 uh, following infection, you will have development of um, antibodies starting with IgM and followed by IgG. And this um, understanding is important because um, based on where or at which point testing is done for a patient, it is quite possible to get a false negative result. For example, if a patient who is positive uh, for COVID-19 is tested too early uh, in the incubation period or too late in the course of the disease. So, um, PCR, which is a polymerase a chain reaction, is a quite useful lab technique um, that allows us to make multiple copies of a segment of a DNA of interest. And this sort of uh, uh, amplification allows us then to detect very minute volumes of nucleic acid segments that are specific to uh, a certain organism or pathogen present in a specimen. And basically, this usually happens in uh, uh, several cycles, as illustrated in this diagram, usually going to around 40 to 45 cycles. And within each cycle, or following each cycle, you have a doubling of the initial amount of uh, nucleic acid that was there in, 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 in the sample. So what usually happens is that then you have a geometric progression so that by the end of a 40 to 45 cycle, you have achieved an exponential amplification of initially very minute uh, amounts of uh, DNA. And this amplification then allows you to detect um, what would have actually been below the limit of uh, detection. So um, when it comes to interpretation of results, again, this uh, is just a brief overview uh, of the type of raw data that is generated from, um, from PCR testing, real-time PCR testing. And within this graph, what we have on the x-axis we have the number of cycles. For example, this is going all the way up to around cycle number 35. And within the y-axis, we have uh, the signal that is generated. And this is usually in terms of fluorescence. Um, you will appreciate that there is a bold line running just above the x-axis, indicated as threshold. And this is, indicates the threshold of positivity. So what usually happens is that, um, as I had alluded to, <clears throat> as the cycles progress, if there is a DNA of interest, that initial amount will be amplified um, in, a in a geometric progression. And this will allow for uh, exponential amplification 
And this usually generates these uh, sigmoid uh, shaped curves. Um, <clears throat> in situations uh, where the initial viral load uh, within the sample was high, <clears throat> you achieve this exponential um, amplification quite early. So the sigmoid curve rises quite early. And in situations where the viral load is low, then this happens quite late. Quite late. The intersection of this threshold with where the, you have the sigmoid curve then generates what we refer to as a CT, which is actually the cycle threshold. So this cycle threshold of CT usually correlates with the amount of viral loads that you have, so that the lower the CT number, then the higher the viral load that you had uh, within the sample that was being analyzed. So the preferred uh, specimen um, is uh, our um, mesopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs. But it's also important to note that there are alternative uh, respiratory samples that are accept acceptable. And these include uh, bronchioviral large sputum. And uh, in some situations, um, um, some tests have been developed that can use saliva as well as nasal swabs, but these usually are not recommended for routine tests. So then the question is, how much of an impact um, does the type of specimen collected have on the overall diagnostic accuracy? because we have said that the preference is mesopharyngeal and oropharyngeal uh, swabs. So in this uh, study, for example, uh, what was observed is that um, comparing um, concordance between mesopharyngeal swabs, the results from mesopharyngeal swabs and oropharyngeal swabs when looked at separately, you have like a 95% concordance, which is a good agreement but um, nasopharyngeal swabs had uh, lower thresholds as indicated by this uh, upper curve. And this was demonstrated right throughout the course of the disease. And uh, the implication of this is that then you have higher viral loads uh, from samples collected from nasopharyngeal swabs. And then the extrapolation from this is that this then will tend to be more accurate. So by and large, mesopharyngeal swabs will um, tend to give more accurate results when compared to oropharyngeal swabs. So when the two of them are then combined, then you do get better diagnostic uh, accuracy. Um, I did highlight that um, in some situations, uh, we can use or nasal swabs or saliva have been used. And again, um, in this uh, uh, first uh, study, uh, it looked at a comparison of uh, nasopharyngeal swabs versus uh, nasal swabs for detection of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And again, comparing, there was a 75% concordance between uh, nasopharyngeal swabs and uh, nasal swabs, and for situations or for those scenarios where there was a discordance, what was noted is that uh, these were samples uh, that had very low viral loads uh, and uh, by extrapolation, they had very high CT levels. So again, uh, what we can gather from this is that, um, the, the, uh, is that uh, the nasal swabs may have very good concordance, but may not be uh, as accurate in detecting uh, samples with the uh, lower viral loads. In another study that was looking at um, nasopharyngeal swabs, comparing them to saliva samples, um, this study compared 200 pairs of nasopharyngeal swabs and saliva, saliva samples uh, for patients who 
uh, were being screened for SARS-CoV-2. And among cohort, 10% of them actually turned out to be positive for SARS-CoV-2 based on uh, the mesoparenial swab testing. And um, surprisingly, there was, uh, again, very good concordance um, uh, using saliva. And uh, maybe in future, this may allow for a non-invasive uh, way of testing for SARS-CoV-2. But again, these are not recommended modalities or recommended samples for testing. But there may be future development that may allow them to be adopted for testing. So specimen handling is uh, critical to ensure accuracy uh, in testing. And uh, samples uh, that have been collected should be immediately placed in a sterile tube containing a viral transport media. In scenarios where uh, the viral transport media may not be available, then there are alternatives, for example, using the EMIS transport media. These samples should then be promptly delivered to the lab. Um, and during shipping, they should be uh, stored at uh, 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. If for any particular reason, uh, there's a delay or a delay is anticipated before testing, then preferably these samples should be stored at uh, negative 70 degrees Celsius, awaiting. So there are various um, genes uh, that can be targeted um, in PCR with a view of identifying SARS-CoV-2. Uh, for example, the N gene um, that, that codes for the nucleocapsid, capsid, as well as the E gene that codes for, for the envelope. We have the S gene that codes for the spike uh, protein. We have the RNA, the gene that codes for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And then we also have the open reading frame, 1AB, that um, codes for quite a number of uh, proteins, including helicase, as well as the RNA-dependent uh, RNA polymerase. So by design, um, most of the assays will have either two or three viral targets. And uh, the setup is that you will have one of the genes, at least one of the genes being specific for the broad uh, subecovirus group. And then you'll have either one or more genes being specific for SARS-CoV-2. Again, looking at the assays, we can have two broad modalities. We can have either closed system or an open system. Uh, closed here meaning that that particular system or modality for testing can only use certain reagents that have been manufactured by a particular uh, pharmaceutical or company. And for an open system, we are talking about um, a system that can use uh, several uh, third-party reagents, uh, uh, and both of them have pros and cons. Uh, for the closed system, uh, it may be more amenable to automation, full automation, Well, that may not be the same uh, for the open system. Um, the downside for the closed system is that there is a restriction in terms of the reagents that can be used. So if there's a stock out, uh, there's a likelihood of testing being grounded. While for the open system, there's flexibility in terms of uh, reagent management. So in terms of um, interpretation of PCR results, um, a result is deemed to be positive if at least two different targets uh, of the COVID-19 uh, virus genome have been detected, and at least one of the targets is uh, specific for the COVID-19 virus. And this is using a validated assay. 
there's um, less utilized um, um, modality of confirming a result, where if, for example, if you have one positive PCR result, just generally for the class, the broad class of uh, beta coronavirus, and then you are able to uh, identify COVID-19 using sequencing of either the partial or the whole of the genome, again, this can be an accepted way of uh, identifying uh, a positive result. Um, as I mentioned, for negative results uh, from patients with um, uh, high index of suspicion, Retesting can be done using uh, samples from uh, the lower respiratory tract. Often, we do have a discordant or inconclusive results. And the recommendation in such situations is to resample the patient and do retesting. And this retesting can be done from the same platform or preferably using an alternative platform. And in such scenarios, it's usually recommended to, uh, to rope in the national reference lab so that possibly they can also do retesting uh, using their platform as well, or give guidelines, uh, guideline on the way to go ahead in such samples. Where appropriate and where uh, situation or um, Testing allows, sequencing can also be done from the original specimen. So uh, some of the challenges um, that can be encountered with molecular testing is false negatives. And false negatives, here we are referring to situations where the result generated is negative in a person or a patient who actually has uh, COVID-19. And there are quite a number of results, uh, quite a number of reasons that can, um, uh, can, 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 can result in such a scenario. One of them being uh, poor quality of the specimen that is collected, uh, where the, the, the specimen has very little patient material. And uh, ways to mitigate this including, include um, proper, play, proper training of the staff that are doing the collection. And um, sometimes the PCR can be configured in such a way that it has a human target within uh, the testing algorithm so that if the sample does not have adequate human uh, material, then that sample will register as being uh, inadequate for testing. We talked about um, samples that are collected too early in the incubation period and specimens that are also collected too late uh, in the infection. Samples that are improperly handled during the transport, for example, being uh, transported while not uh, refrigerated, can also generate um, uh, false negative results. Um, you can also have situations where you have, because we said that the PCR looks at certain um, target genes, if we have mutation within the target gene, then they may not be picked out uh, by the assay again, and this can generate uh, false negative results. The last reason is um, presence of um, substances that can inhibit the PCR um, uh, process can also again uh, lead to uh, false negative results. Uh, false positive results um, is uh, situations or scenarios where you have a result that is positive in a patient who truly does not have a COVID-19 result, who does not have COVID-19 disease. And there are a couple of reasons uh, that can result in this. Well, some of them are analytical issues, such as carryover, uh, um, so that you have carryover if one of the samples that is being run uh, 
uh, is positive and then you have carryover during pipetting, uh, this can, can lead to a poor quality result. If the system is not properly calibrated, uh, this again can also result in uh, false positive results. In the post-analytical, um, um, in the post-analytical area, if interpretation is not done properly, uh, again, you can also have positive, or you have is, is, or can also have situations where during transcription uh, of the results, uh, they are wrongly put uh, and recorded as positive, when in actual sense, the actual result was negative. So based on um, the gravity that a positive or a negative COVID result carries, then it only follows that ensuring quality is a critical uh, factor. And um, when it comes to ensuring quality, we are talking about uh, during the whole process, all the way from sample collection to analysis of the sample, as well as um, recording of the result and uh, relaying of the same results to the relevant parties, whether it is to the patient or to the doctor who requested the patient. So during the pre-analytic period, this is during the collection of the sample, um, some of the things that can be done to ensure quality is ensuring, is ensuring that uh, there's adequacy in the sample that is collected by properly training the staff. Um, and during the analytical period, there are various uh, ways of ensuring that the analytical period is up to par. And this includes using different types of, types of controls. Um, the internal control looks at the process of amplification as well as extraction of the DNA material. And for each sample, the internal control has to pass for that sample to be released as um, having been validly, having been validly run. And also during testing, we have samples that are known to be positive and samples that are known to be negative. And these are usually tested together with the other samples and these samples must test as, um, as, 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 as prescribed, meaning that the, the positive control has to turn out positive and the negative control has to turn out negative when the testing is done. Then we also have the role of the proficiency testing. And this um, refers to uh, programs where labs are supplied with um, blinded samples by an accredited um, by an accredited body, and they are supposed to run those uh, blind samples, generate the results, and uh, forward the results to the accrediting body, which will then um, be monitoring. Uh, the and again, uh, for a lab to be given a go ahead to operate uh, and do testing, then their proficiency testing must be up to par according to the body that is supplying uh, the reagents or the, that is applying the material for proficiency testing. <clears throat> for the post analytical period, um, Again, um, you can have a two-tiered kind of reporting where you have a primary reviewer and a secondary reviewer who looks at the results. And the aim of this is just to prevent some of the transcription errors so that if the primary reviewer made an error in terms of the, the data entry, this can be picked up by the secondary reviewer and it can be rectified uh, um, in the fastest uh, way possible before it impacts on uh, patient management. Again, one of the challenges that um, has been picked out and is, a, is, a, is, is, is quite a challenge 
is uh, patients who develop positive results uh, after apparent recovery, after apparent recovery, some of them even months after apparent recovery. And at this point, or at this juncture, expert opinion seems to suggest against the reinfection. Uh, and the suggestions are that uh, this most likely represents uh, persistent excretion of dead uh, non-infective uh, viral RNA. <clears throat> So um, for the serological tests, um, essentially they aim to detect the body's immune response to SARS-CoV-2 exposure. And in brief, you have, uh, you obtain a specimen, a blood specimen from the, from the patient. And this uh, specimen is uh, exposed to SARS-CoV-2 antigen. And if <clears throat> there are antibodies in that blood sample, they will react uh, antigens that are present in the test. And this will usually be detected as a color change uh, within uh, the particular test uh, that is used. So um, currently, there are two main <clears throat> antigens that are used to detect antibodies uh, in patients. And these include the spike glycoprotein, that is the S protein, as well as the N uh, phosphoprotein. And the thing to note is that for the S protein is that there are quite a number of, um, or quite a number of the uh, forms of S protein that can be used as antigens. And uh, depending on the type of the, uh, or the form of the, uh, the S protein that is used, you can have varying levels of cross reactivity as well as uh, specificity, because in general, the N is more conserved across the various coronaviruses uh, compared to the S. So the tests have been developed, that have been developed uh, can detect uh, various immunoglobulin classes. Uh, that is including the immunoglobulin G, the M, as well as the immunoglobulin A. And as a rule of thumb, um, prolonged detection of IgG will usually be a marker for development of immunity, while um, having elevated titers of IgA and, IgG, IgA and IgM will usually um, correspond to the acute convalescent uh, stage. So there are various studies that have tried to look at um, diagnostic performance of serological tests. Um, and for example, in this particular study, um, there, were, there were 142 uh, seronegative samples, and these were samples that were collected uh, before the pandemic broke out. And this, there were also an, another 40 samples that were collected from uh, COVID-19 positive patients. And for these positive samples, uh, some of them were within what can be regarded as the acute period, that is within 28 days from the onset of symptoms. And then there were also those that were in the convalescent period. And within this study, they used uh, the ELISA method, as well as the, the lateral flow Amino acids. And um, what was noted is that for the ELISA, the sensitivity was about 85% uh, for all the samples. And this uh, rose to about 100% uh, for samples that were collected for, um, that, that were collected more than day 10, on day 10 following infection. And the specificity was quite good. For the lateral flow amino acids, the sensitivity was quite variable uh, from 55 to about 70%, uh, while the specificity was anywhere from between 90 to 100%. So um, based on this, uh, especially for the lateral uh, flow amino acids, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, sensitivity is quite an issue uh, 
And like I had alluded to, this is dependent on the antigenic targets that are used uh, uh, for detecting antibodies in the patient. So what is the utility for serological testing? So it is agreeable that uh, it, it's not a modality that is requested, that is recommended for diagnosis. Um, but there are other uses uh, for, for serological tests. One is disease surveillance uh, to determine the spread of the COVID-19 in the general population. Um, can also be used to determine the actual proportion of the population that has been exposed and subsequently developed immunity. And, and this is maybe of use in risk stratification uh, in healthcare workers. Um, it can also be used for generating data uh, with regards to the immune response um, to COVID-19, which may be useful in development of vaccine. Um, again, um, it might be useful for identifying potential donor, donors for convalescent plasma. And in persons who develop uh, post-infectious syndrome, uh, for example, in children caused by SARS-CoV-2, serological tests may be useful in aiding diagnosis because at this point, uh, you don't expect um, uh, the, the, the molecular test or rather the molecular test may actually turn out to be negative in such scenarios. So viral cultures are not recommended for routine diagnosis. They do require specialized, specialized labs, uh, that is biosafety level, uh, at least biosafety level three. And most of their utility is in research. Uh, for example, looking at um, antiviral agents, as well as vaccine development, and also studying uh, pathogenesis uh, of the disease. They are also useful in establishing uh, virus and also for detection of neutralizing antibodies in convalescent plasma. We do have um, adjunct tests that are not necessarily for diagnosis of COVID-19, but are useful for prognostication. And most of these are serum biomarkers of inflammation. So elevated levels of uh, C-reactive protein, uh, LDH, D-dimers, ferritin, troponin, uh, as well as um, reduced levels of lymphocyte count may pertain to a poor prognosis in patients who have a, a COVID-19 disease. So if we look at the epidemiological evolution uh, in terms of the transmission uh, of COVID-19, right from uh, the sporadic cases going all the way to uh, community transition, transmission, we can appreciate that there has been an evolution in terms of case, case management, as well as in terms of case definition, as, we, as well as in terms of management. For example, initially during um, the early pandemic, uh, the case definition was uh, quite heavily hinged on a history of travel. While this may not be the case uh, in situations where you have uh, local transmission. In terms of the uh, management, um, we have had an evolution. Uh, where, for example, the criteria for discharge initially uh, was hinged on having negative uh, COVID results, well, that may not be the case uh, with, with uh, the situation currently. So the evolution of the epidemiology of uh, the transmission has also affected uh, the testing strategy, as we shall see. So we have, uh, I have um, alluded to the fact that in the early stages of the pandemic, um, 
testing was targeted at symptomatic patients and their contacts, and uh, also on uh, international travelers arriving in the country. Well, within uh, in situations where you have uh, established uh, transmission, local transmission, what would be ideal will be mass testing, but uh, there are considerations that have to be made, uh, including issues of sustaining such a program, as uh, we also have to be alive to the fact um, that um, there is quite a heavy demand of reagents globally, and uh, which will correspond to regular shortages. And this uh, may mean that mass testing may not be applicable uh, in all circumstances. But mass testing can be implemented for special groups, especially for areas where you have uh, geographical hotspots. So what is uh, in use currently is uh, targeted testing, uh, where testing is uh, is indicated or reserved for high risk priority groups. And this will include uh, frontline healthcare workers, uh, long distance truck drivers, uh, air crew, airline crew, staff working at ports, whether this is seaports or airports, and even patients with chronic diseases that are likely to be complicated by COVID-19. Um, on top of these, there are other considerations that need to be made. Um, uh, because now we have situations where you have uh, more and more uh, testing on demands by clients. Uh, we have testing uh, as a requirement for airline travelers. And um, again, this may vary from institution to institution. We may have COVID testing as a requirement for hospital admission. Um, uh, whether it is for surgery or just for medical uh, purposes or for medical reasons. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Francis Kiyugu for the um, insightful uh, presentation um, on COVID-19 testing. Uh, so we have a few questions uh, that have been raised in our chat box and um, I'm going to request uh, my panelists, uh, that is Dr. Alice Kinyua and um, uh, Dr. Abubakar Abdila um, to join in to be able to answer um, some of the questions. So I will start with uh, Dr. Francis, sorry, uh, from the presentation, uh, there's someone who has asked about how practical it is to maintain the cold chain, especially um, the negative 70 degrees Celsius that is recommended uh, in, a, in, in a case where we anticipate delay. Dr. Francis. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so uh, in, in, in most of the scenarios, uh, where you um, anticipate that you will be able to test, for example, within uh, 48 hours, uh, storage at two to eight degrees will be sufficient. So when I was referring to the negative 70 degrees Celsius, that applies for situations where, for example, you are anticipating that you won't be able to do testing within those 48 hours. And I think for most scenarios, 48 hours will be sufficient to allow for testing. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question will be directed to Dr. Alice um, Kinyo. Uh, so a patient who is HIV positive on medication, uh, will the COVID results be positive? Thanks for, for the question. Um, indeed, there is no anticipated cross-reactivity where PCR is concerned between HIV and SARS-CoV. Um, they belong to extremely different families. 
So even if a patient is on medication, then it will not affect um, the result. So when you get a positive COVID result, it's because of the COVID, not because of the HIV. So with or without medication, because they have different um, genetic structures, um, PCR is able to pick it up quite well without any cross-reactivity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alice. Um, Dr. Abu Bakari, maybe you could answer this for us. Um, so Benjamin asks, I have a patient who exhibited um, suspicious respiratory symptoms and was even admitted in ICU and discharged uh, two days. That was in February. Please comment on whether antibody testing would be diagnostically relevant in retrospect and um, also comment on its availability and its cost. Um, so to start with the uh, timing of the symptoms in November, um, we have no documented cases of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infections back in November. And with the timing, that will make it highly unlikely. But uh, with the ICU admission in February, in February, we still didn't have any uh, documentation of SARS-CoV-2 infection in the country. But if there was a history of travel to uh, either Europe or Asia, back then we had uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, in Europe and Asia. So if those history of travel, it's possible that it could be. On the issue of the antibody testing, uh, if a patient was exposed and uh, recovered, uh, doing antibody testing would actually uh, pick up the guys who've been exposed and have now recovered. And depending on uh, what kit you would use, the different kits have different performances. So if they have enough IgG, they could be picked up. But still, even within the patients who get exposed and recover, there are patients who are asymptomatic and don't develop enough antibodies that, age, that can be picked up by the, uh, what is in the market so far. Uh, and in terms of availability in the country, uh, MOH have to this point not authorized the use of uh, serology testing for SARS-CoV-2. And what is available so far is only used for serosurveillance uh, studies. And uh, I'm not sure of the cost because uh, no, none is commercially available in the country right now. Okay. I don't know if I've answered everything. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Abu Bakar. Um, so another question is uh, for the discounted uh, results from one lab, can one, uh, can one sample be used uh, to repeat the test in another lab? Uh, is resampling uh, compulsory? Uh, I will direct that to Dr. Alice. Sorry, thanks for, for that question. It's one that um, is, can generate very many different responses. Um, ideally, if you are trying to troubleshoot um, what could the issue could be, um, if your uh, laboratory has two different methods, then you can retest that sample with a different assay and see whether you get the same result. If you get the same result, then you're likely confirming that with the, with the two different assays. Uh, on a practical basis, um, if you're still getting that situation where the two results are discrepant, then it's prudent um, to use the national testing laboratories and uh, the National Influenza Laboratory, the NIC lab, uh, under the National Public Health Laboratories have been very open and amenable to being used to, the, to, um, to conclude these cases where you have it being positive and negative uh, in, in different laboratories. Um, that would help at least with the patient. If we were to ideally troubleshoot the result of a discrepant sample, and if there's enough sample, then perhaps it would be good to have the exact same sample that was used and um, retested at all the three laboratories so that it, we then eliminate the issues of sampling errors. So there are various ways to, to look at it. If you want to just address, um, at least for the patient, and your lab has two different methods, then test it on a different method. If you do not have, then you can always work closely with the, with the National Public Health Laboratories and at the National Influenza Center to at least help um, troubleshoot those cases. Okay, um, so thank you for that. Uh, our next, next question, uh, does COVID-19 um, 
does a COVID-19 infected pregnant mother uh, pass antibodies to the baby? Uh, maybe Dr. Francis, you can help us with that. So, um, as, um, as you would expect with a disease that is um, relatively quite uh, young, um, we don't have significant data uh, from um, a, a cohort of positive COVID-19 um, mothers to draw that conclusion. So I think um, uh, at this particular juncture, I would say there is no evidence to suggest that uh, that, is, that is the case. But again, this is something that is likely to develop as we get more and more data of probably COVID-19 patients who go on to deliver and then now this uh, can be followed up in the, in the neonates. Neurological tests can be done and we can have a significant body of evidence to draw conclusions from. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, so Dr. Abubakar, uh, maybe you could help us answer this. Um, how effective is it, uh, is a stool test uh, for COVID-19 test using a stool sample? So um, there have been a few studies showing uh, shedding of the virus uh, in stool. Actually, a few more studies showing that uh, the virus could be shed through the stool for quite a longer time than uh, from respiratory uh, 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 from respiratory samples. But clinically, what that means, uh, we really don't know, because. As we know, it's a respiratory virus that causes respiratory issues. And what is, uh, and so far, I don't think there is any study that shows that uh, what is being uh, secreted in stool is actually a viable virus. Uh, there are no viral cultures to show that there are any vi uh, viable viruses that are being excreted in the stool. Um, clinically, this is a respiratory virus, and I don't think uh, it has it will add any value to actually be doing uh, stool uh, PCRs for this particular virus. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abubakar. Um, I'm directing the next question to my other panelists, uh, Dr. Kibet uh, Shikuku, um, to comment on the method used uh, posthumously and its e uh, efficacy in testing for COVID-19. Dr. Kibet? Sorry, Bosibori, what was the question? My network is relatively bad. Sorry, um, I can uh, repeat my question. Uh, kindly comment on the method uh, used uh, posthumously and its uh, efficacy in terms of uh, COVID-19 testing. Yeah, so basically what has been happening is uh, people have been using um, you know, different uh, sample types, but a lot of times uh, we still use uh, the oral or nasopharyngeal swabs um, to check uh, the exposure. But other than that, uh, sometimes I've seen also people getting or doing minimal invasive uh, procedures, getting, uh, you know, specimens from uh, the lung using uh, minimal invasive uh, procedures. Uh, and this has actually been uh, tried to see the level of the positivity. And uh, we've uh, seen this uh, from uh, cases uh, that have been uh, done uh, minimal invasive postmortems. So you can actually get uh, the samples within the oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal region or actually do minimal invasive uh, lung uh, biopsies uh, for uh, testing. Okay. I think that question has been answered. Thank you, Dr. Kibet. Um, so I also have another question. Um, this will be answered by Dr. Alice. So if a sample is taken from a patient and the results released after nine days and they turn out to be positive, uh, do we have to isolate the case uh, for treatment? Um, Again, thank you for that question. Um, I think there were some updates in the national guidelines um, which now say that um, after 10 days since the positive test, uh, with three of those days being um, asymptomatic, that is no fever, no cough, 
um, then you can be considered as discharged from um, from quarantine. However, I just need to say that we also need to be careful, even as you wait for those results, to con to uh, to remain in to remain in isolation. So the current national guidelines are actually saying that ten days from the date of the first positive, as long as you have been asymptomatic for seventy two hours, that's three days, you can be discharged from quarantine. So that's the current update from from MOH. All right. Thank you, Dr. Alice. Um, I will also ask another question. This is directed to Dr. Abu Bakar. Um, is it okay for a COVID survivor to donate blood? Um, so, so far there's nothing to show that uh, the virus can be transmitted via blood. Um, but generally what has been used uh, elsewhere is uh, at least do uh, once they've recovered like 28 days after, uh, then they can uh, go, go ahead and donate. But as you know, we, or we already have the questionnaire, the blood donor questionnaire that addresses issues like if the patient has any fevers or any symptoms. And if they're symptomatic at the time, of course, they'll not be allowed to donate. But as far as uh, SARS-CoV-2 is concerned, there's nothing really to show up to this point that it can be transmitted through blood. And even at studies looking at uh, uh, PCRs run with different samples, uh, when patient samples were run with blood samples were run for SARS-CoV-2 PCR, it picked less than 1% uh, from blood, uh, while the respiratory samples, of course, picked up much higher levels. And the uh, virus was also isolated from stool and lower and upper respiratory tract uh, samples, but in blood it was less than 1%. So I don't think blood is really a way that it can be transmitted, not as far as what we know now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Kibet, maybe you could answer for us our last question. So someone says, uh, Kenya seems to be uh, bending the curve uh, lately uh, with lower numbers of confirmed cases in Nairobi and Mombasa. Does the trajectory suggest that uh, COVID is uh, getting behind us? Dr. Kibet? Uh, I think he had network issues. So maybe Dr. Francis uh, Kigu, you can assist us in uh, answering the question. Um, thank you, Dr. Bosibor. Um, as, uh, as I think the CAS for Health had uh, alluded to during our, one of our daily updates, I think in as much as we seem to be witnessing a plateauing or an apparent decline uh, in terms of the, the positive numbers that we are getting, I, I, my feeling is that it's a bit too premature to draw that sort of conclusion. And um, maybe if the, that kind of trajectory is sustained for a couple of months, then and we are sustaining uh, adequate numbers of tests per day, and we are seeing um, a sustained decrease in terms of the positivity rate, as well as in the case fatality rate, then in that situation, then it's possible to draw those conclusions. But again, as, as of this particular point, I think it's a bit too premature. To, to celebrate such. All right. Um, so can someone have a false positive uh, antibody test? Uh, so I think uh, Dr. Alice Kinyo. Yes, indeed, it's possible to get a false positive because there really is no laboratory test that has 100% sensitivity, um, meaning that you with whichever test you do, there is a possibility of getting a false positive test. Um, however, as um, Dr. Francis and Dr. Bobaka have, have, have mentioned, is that at the moment, um, serologic testing has not been rolled out in Kenya. So we don't have much experience in our setting of what are the likely issues that would cause cross-reactivity and false positive tests. So I think that's part of the reason why the government has been quite insistent on use of PCR that's a molecular-based method for diagnosis. But yes, indeed, we expect false positives. 
And just going by our experience with other serological tests, um, we are likely, it would be likely to, if you if I was doing a validation, just to ensure that there's no cross reactivity, I would start with those groups of, of viruses that are close in structure to the COVID. So like the ones that cause the common cold, if you're able to get people who have common cold and make sure um, as you're validating your test that you run some of their samples so that you make sure there's no cross reactivity. And again, remember as uh, Dr. Kigu shared the human coronaviruses that cause common cold such as HKU1, they're quite common. It's actually said that about 95% of us have had a common cold infection at one point or another that's due to those coronaviruses. So then if I was validating a, a serological assay, it's important that we make sure that there is no cross reactivity on something that is so widespread in the community. So yes, it's possible to get, and you'd likely get it from um, viruses that have a similar structure to, to your COVID. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alice. Um, I will direct this question to Dr. Abu Bakar. Uh, so there's a time we had COVID-19 patients testing uh, negative on repeat, and when confirmation is done, uh, they then test positive again. So what could be uh, the problem? Dr. Abu Bakar? Um, so, um, trying to understand the question. So this is a patient who had a positive test, then got a negative and a positive after the negative. Yes, yes. So uh, that can happen and uh, that has been shown, especially with the variability in shedding of the virus uh, when using an esophageal swab uh, for the diagnosis or for the PCR. So there is quite a variation in how the virus is shed from the respiratory tract, especially in the nasopharyngeal space. Um, so you could have day one having a high viral load and day two the viral load coming down so that it's sort of picked up. And then there are also issues of sampling as uh, Francis had alluded to. So the sampling might not be the same as when it was done on the day two that gave the negative result. Um, so Variations either in the viral shedding or variation in how the sample was taken can actually give you a negative result than a positive result after that. Yeah, so it's not impractical or impossible to have uh, such situations. And I think there's another question that's uh, related to that, and that is patients testing positive after treatment and after symptoms have uh, resolved. So as uh, Alice had alluded to, uh, we don't need to repeat testing uh especially for the asymptomatic and mild disease if it's 10 days past uh when the diagnosis was made uh including three days without fevers and symptoms uh that patient does not need testing anymore so it's been shown that uh, patients can shed viruses for a much longer time some even to 60 days past the first uh, pcr test so you don't need to keep on testing. If you keep on testing, you'll find patients shedding virus up to even 60 or over 60 days. But it's been shown that most of those are non-viable uh, viral particles, non-viable viral particles, and they are not transmittable or are not infectious. All right. Thank you, Dr. Abubakar. Uh, so I think I'll direct this uh, last question to our presenter, uh, Dr. Francis. Um, if you could kindly give us updates about the COVID-19 vaccine, where are we? So I, most of the programs or most of the ventures into vaccine production um, have been on the, at, at different levels. Some of them have been conducted um, on a multinational uh, scale. Others, others have been conducted uh, on a national level. Um, if case in point being the vaccine that is currently being rolled out uh, in Russia as we speak. So we, we have various vaccines uh, that are in development and most of them are at different um, stages of trials. Um, as uh, far as I know, the only one that um, has gone into uh, clinical use is um, the Russian vaccine. 
Most of the others are still uh, within trial. Um, the projection uh, for most of them is that uh, there could be headway probably by the start of uh, next year, uh, maybe the first half of next year. But again, but again most of these are just projections that will depend on um, the outcome of the various uh, vaccine trials. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Francis. Um, I think we've come to an end of our session uh, this afternoon. Um, and this was facilitated by the Kenya Association of uh, Clinical uh, uh, Pathologists. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Dr. Francis Kiegu, uh, who's the clinical pathologist at uh, Nairobi Hospital, Dr. Kibet uh, Shikuku, uh, the laboratory director, uh, the microbiology and infectious uh, diseases uh, uh, research uh, laboratory, uh, Dr. Alice Kinyo, uh, who is the head of microbiology and molecular section of the Nairobi Hospital, and uh, Dr. Abubakar Abdila, uh, who's a lecturer in uh, microbiology and molecular uh, pathology at the Aga Khan um, University Hospital. So I want to thank everyone uh, that was able to attend uh, this uh, session uh, from all over. Uh, thank you so much for participating and uh, for asking uh, your questions. So the recorded uh, version of this webinar is going to be shared uh, with us uh, so that those, in case uh, anyone missed it, can be able to uh, view and um, um, uh, be able to get their questions uh, answered. So thank you so much. I think we are going to end uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Felisa Sposibori and all our panelists. That was our wonderful presentation and we have learned a lot. I want to give Dr. Simon Kigondu from KMA to give us a word of Kwaheri and then we'll close. Over. Thank you, Bosibori. Very good. Uh, taking the session very well. This uh, series has been brought to you by the medical associations and KMPDU is the KMA Kenya and Nursing Nanak uh, Nursing Association of Kenya, Kenya Clinical Officers Association, uh, and KMPDU as a collaboration of the same. We want our health workers to be able to uh, have COVID knowledge at the tip of their fingers to prevent themselves from getting COVID and to, prevent, to help others not get COVID. And I want to thank Dr. Francis uh, Kiigu for such a good presentation and the other presenters uh, for uh, taking us through this uh, testing issue. It's still an issue even after that presentation. We are still trying to digest what he has said, but I, 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 I guess it's, it's a process. So on behalf of uh, KMA, and uh, I can see the CEO is online and Dr. Joy Mugambi who have been charged with taking this series. Uh, I want to thank all of you for attending. And uh, the CPD points will be emailed to the email you use to register for this uh, 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 webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kigondu. Before uh, I hand it over to the moderator, I would want to announce that next week we shall be doing maternity and COVID-19, how the change, how COVID-19 is impacting maternity. We shall be having COGS leaders and the nursing association, uh, the Thank you, thank you very much, Liz. I think we've come to the end of our webinar. So, Again, we normally have on Tuesdays the mental health webinars and Thursdays the COVID-19 case management webinars. And uh, these sessions have been uh, very powerful learning experiences and we are getting a lot of feedback from our members. So continue attending them and let the, learn the learning and education continue as Dr. Kigondu has said. Asante sana and God bless you. Have a lovely, a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.